Good morning, everyone. Welcome to church, those who are here and those who uh, will watch our recording service. May the Lord be with you, as the Lord be with us also today. Uh, announcements from Dylan for today. Good morning. So unfortunately, our epiphany reader from, uh, for this morning isn't able to be here. Um, so Isabel will be doing the reading, but um, we do appreciate the epiphany reading um, exchange that we have. And Gina is at Southminster United Church this morning. There are a few things I want to highlight briefly for you. The first being this Tuesday. Um, first of all, for Tuesday, there will be pickleball, if you're interested in that, from 10 to 12. So it says no pickleball, but it will still be happening. And then following pickleball in the evening, from 5 to 7 p.m., is going to be the Shrove Tuesday uh, Pancake and Sausage Supper. So please bring yourselves, your family, your friends, your neighbors, uh, and enjoy a time of fellowship here at the church with us. Lenten lunches will begin on February 22nd, and the information, the dates, and locations for all of that is in the bulletin. On February 24th, our MORE team is going to be participating in Coldest Night of the Year, so please, if you're interested in that fundraiser and you'd like to go do some walking with some wonderful people, uh, take a look at that information. And uh, if you're not up to walking, you can still make donations uh, towards that fundraiser. And hopefully we will be able to uh, outcompete St. Augustine's who have issued a challenge for us. Uh, the other thing I'd like to highlight is about teenagers. If anyone has ever raised teenagers, uh, I'm sure you know it is a piece of cake. <laughs> If there are uh, people who do have teenagers in their lives right now, uh, you'll know that it can be challenging. And in light of that, St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church in Calgary is starting a weekly book study on Zoom. So you can join virtually Wednesday evenings uh, from February 21st to March 13th, studying the book, The Emotional Lives of Teenagers. Raising Connected, Capable, and Compassionate Adolescents by Lisa Damore. So there is more information if you would like to sign up for that. The other exciting thing that we have coming up is uh, going to be this Thursday, and I'm going to have Lavinia come in and share a little bit more about that. Good morning. So in your, um, in your weekly events, it lists choir 7 p.m. on Thursday and I want you all to know that we would love to have you join us uh, with the choir but we do have choir it's not going to be here at St. Andrews we'll be um, doing our concert as a fundraiser for the food bank at Southminster Church and we would love to have you come a special thanks to all the volunteers who have welcomed everyone for rehearsals last Thursday we had over 55 people present and uh, we couldn't have done it without you um, it's been a joy to put together and we would just love for you to come and and see this mass community choir that st. Andrews is part of this Thursday at Southminster 7 30 p.m. now the choir has been working very hard in preparation for this event so next Sunday they have a well-deserved break no choir next Sunday but we do have some special music that you are invited to participate in. We'll be singing Come to the Church in the Wildwood. And after the service today, there is a very short rehearsal up here by the piano led by Corey. Um, and so if you have wanted to sing but don't want to commit to choir, this is a great chance to join us after the service. Come to the Church in the Wildwood. Thank you. Thank you, Dylan and Lafinia. I love when the church is busy. Pickleball, pancake supper, choir concert, and so on. The church is alive. <laughs> Friends, join me for the call to worship for today. 
Lord Jesus, on this day when you reveal your glory to your disciples, as we gaze on the splendor of your love, Emmanuel, everlasting God, Prince of Peace. Our first hymn for today comes from hymns um, number 375, Fairest Lord Jesus, I invite you to stand if you are able. of the world find an equal place of love and security. In you we all receive redemption from our sins and the promise of eternal life. Your life also provides us with the perfect example of how we should love and care for each other, regardless of our backgrounds, race or ethnicity. Jesus is the Prince of Peace, and today he invites us to lay aside the instruments of war and to live in peace with each other. On this Transfiguration Sunday, help us to see you in all your glory and splendor, the Word made flesh, and may this glory through the Holy Spirit transform our lives. And in a world filled with hate and injustice, inspire us, O Lord, to build the tabernacles of justice, peace, and love until the earth is full of your glory as the water covers the seas. Amen. Friends, before we come together for our prayer of confession, we're going to sing hymn number 64, Be Still and Know That I Am God. Please stand if you are able.
Please be seated. Join me in unison for our prayer of confession for today. Forgiving God, you call us to love each other regardless of our race, color, or creed. But we confess that we find it easier to hate those who do not look like us, share our religion or our values. We silently participate in unequal systems that are structured to negatively impact some groups of people and benefit others on the basis of race prejudice. You call us, your church, to be one, neither Jew nor Greek, neither bond nor free, neither male nor female. But we admit that your church is marked by elements of hate and divisions. Forgive us, Lord. Remove things that cause us to hate and distrust each other. Help us to follow the example of our Lord revealed to us today. Remind us of Jesus' love, mercy, and compassion. Make us instruments of your love and peace in our world today. Amen. Lovely. Now hear the good news for the assurance of pardons. Christ Jesus died for our sins and rose again. That God may free us from the tyranny of judging others, perhaps self, to live fully in the power of God's grace. So in the name of Jesus Christ, God forgives your sins and offers you a transformed future. So my friends, live fully into God's grace. And if you feel comfortable, let us pass the grace and love and peace of Christ to one another. Behind you, beside you, in front of you. Peace and love and grace of the Lord be with you. And also with you all online viewers. Friends, today, Ministry of Music will sing the gift of love. So enjoy and be blessed.
Thank you, Senator Squire. Friends, today for the time, time for the young at hearts, we are going to talk about one of the most famous story in the Bible. I believe even if you do not regularly come to the church or you do not uh, affiliate with denomination or church when you were small kids, I believe you know this story. Can you guess what story is this? Jonah. That's right. I remember when I was small, first time I was... Uh, small and then i went to the sunday school first time i heard this story oh boy i was afraid the way this teacher vividly described the story oh, make me fear of ocean and sea it seems like whenever i go swimming something underneath me like ready to up <laughs> and keep me inside and uh and not only that not only the way the, she described and vividly the story makes me fear of ocean and swimming uh, on the wide sea and water but the point that she highlight basically the point that i remember that that's what happened to you when you disobey god which is correct actually yeah jonah disobeyed god ran away god said go to the east he he went to the go to the west he went to the east to tarsus and then because of that uh, Big she, uh, a big uh, uh, a fish uh, swallowed him. Well, that's correct. But then, um, as I grew up, and then the more I see this story, the more I realized that actually, we still can see God's love even when we are stuck in the belly of the fish. Maybe we do not like literally stuck in the belly of the fish right now, but maybe stuck in, I don't know. Maybe you are at home with your illness, physical challenges. You are stuck. You cannot go anywhere, and then you, maybe you think this is kind of like punishment or life challenges, whatever is stuck situation. But I just want you to know that there's not punishment, there's not God dislike you and then, and then keep you stuck. You can feel stuck but still sacred at the moment. So the story begins as God suddenly, out of the blue, the word of God came to Jonah. Arise, go to Nineveh. Suddenly. And this is, um, Jonah is the only prophet that, get, uh, that God asked to go to foreign land to prophesy on behalf of God. Other prophets stay where they were and then just prophesy. But Jonah, no, you go, arrive to Nineveh. And we know the story, Jonah disobey. But I want to share with you something else when Jonah was in the belly of the fish. So, um, Jonah disobeyed, Jonah went to another place, and then stuck, uh, and then uh, get eaten by the, uh, uh, a big fish. Last week, I saw this, do you know this uh, statue, bronze statue, Christ of the Abyss? Christ of the Abyss, or the Italian, originally in Italian, in Italian says that, Il Cristo degli Abyssi. This bronze statue is a submerged bronze statue of Jesus Christ by Guido Galetti. The original cast of which is located in the Mediterranean Sea of San Fruttuoso between Camogli and Portofino on the Italian Riviera. This bronze statue was sculpted by Guido Galetti based on the idea of Italian diving instructor Duilo Marcante. This statue was placed near the spot where Dario Gosanti died in 1947. He was the first Italian to use scuba gear. Uh, this statue depicts Christ offering a benediction of peace with his head and hands rise up skyward. You can only see this when you go down deep enough to see this Christ of the abyss. And you feel like you are in the lowest point and you cannot find God. I want you to know you are wrong. God is deeper and lower still. 
Jonah was stuck in the belly of the fish. But chapter 2, Jonah turned around and prayed to God. It says for three days and three nights in the belly of the fish. They were stuck, but it was a sacred moment for Jonah. He encountered God in the belly of the fish. We will see this story more in the sermon. For now, let's close uh, with the, the Lord's Prayer together. Good morning. Hear the word of God today coming from Jonah chapter 1, verses 1 through 17, and can be found on page 859 of your pew Bible. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, saying, Go at once to Nineveh, the great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah set out to flee to Tarshish, from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid his fare and went on board to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and such a mighty storm came upon the sea that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried to his God. They threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. Jonah, meanwhile, had gone down into the hold of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. The captain came and said to him, what are you doing sound asleep? Get up, call on the God. Perhaps the God, uh, the God will spare us a thought so that we do not perish. The sailors said to one another, come, let us cast lots so that we may know on whose account this calamity has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. They said to him, Tell us why this calamity has come upon us. What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? I am a Hebrew, he replied. I worship the Lord, God, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were even more afraid and said to him, what is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them so. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may quieten down for us? For the sea was growing more and more tempestuous. He said to them, Pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will quieten down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great storm has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rowed hard to bring the ship back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more stormy against them. Then they cried out to the Lord, Please, O Lord, we pray, do not let us perish on account of this man's life. Do not make us guilty of innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it, is, it pleased you. So they picked Jonah up and threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. 
Then the men feared the Lord even more, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. But the Lord provided a large fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Isabel. Let us pray, friends. O oh God, in you are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Open our minds and our hearts so that we may perceive the wonders of your word and give us grace that we may clearly understand and freely choose the way of your wisdom through Christ our Lord. Amen. Friends, Jonah's book is super brief, only four chapters with 48 verses in total. You could read it through um, this book in about like 15 minutes. Surprisingly though, this book covers everything that we need about living in a full awareness that we live in the presence of God all day. Perhaps you still remember the idea of Koran Deo, that's concept that we uh, talk about repeat, uh, for many times uh, as we study from Ecclesiastes last year. This book also gives us a peek into God's heart about people that we might not be fond of or see them as enemies. The book of Jonah can be divided into four parts. Chapter 1, Jonah is running from God. Chapter 2, Jonah is praying to God in the belly of the fish. And chapter 3, Jonah is speaking for God in any way on behalf of God, preaching to the people of Nidive. And chapter 4, Jonah is learning about God, in particular God's grace to him and to the people of Nidive. And I believe this pattern, running, praying, speaking, and also learning. I believe we who have been Christians for many years, we have experienced these chapters also in our life. There were seasons where we were running from God, praying to God, Speaking for God. And throughout all these seasons, we are learning something new about God. So Jonah's story is actually our story. We call this book also one of the minor prophets. Not because of their works are minor or insignificant, but because their records are brief. So in, this, uh, in the book of Jonah, there is only one prophecy recorded actually that's in jonah chapter 3 verse 4 that's it so it's really a book about jonah and his honest relationship with god and we know that our lord jesus loved this story because jonah is the only minor prophet jesus mentioned by name matthew 12 40 jesus said for as Jonah was in the belly of the great fish for three days and three nights, so will the Son of Man, referring to himself, be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. Now the story begins this way. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. Now, a word-to-word -word translation says this, Arise, with exclamation, Arise, go to Nineveh. That's what the Hebrew translation literally says. The meaning is like, Hey Jonah, get up and go to Nineveh now. Now. Isn't it amazing how just one sentence can change Jonah's life? One sentence can change your life too. Perhaps your child called and has said, Mom, you're going to be a grandma next week. Someone is going to be grandma next week. After so many years, you have not held a baby in your hands. And soon, in one week, you will hold one again. That type of news changes your life. That's what happened to Jonah when God spoke four little words. Arise, go to Nineveh. Out of the blue, the word of God came to Jonah. And soon after, his life 
dramatically changed not only the lives, not only his life, but also the lives of the people of Nineveh. And friends, note what Jonah had to do in Nineveh. Arise, go to Nineveh, and preach against it. This is not a, oh, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life kind of message. This bad news, this is bad news from the Almighty God. Arise, go to the Nineveh and preach against it. The reason, because its wickedness has come up before me. In short, the time for judgment had come, had come upon Nineveh. But I, the Lord, want you, Jonah, to warn them, the people of Nineveh. Who knows, they might have repented. Give a try. Let's see how they respond. When God said that the Nineveh's inhabitants were wicked, God was not kidding. Nineveh was the capital of Assyria, the most powerful empire in the world on that day. And the Assyrians had a reputation, not the good reputation, but for cruelty. There is hard for us to fathom. I give footnotes if you want to see the cruelty that they did in the past. It's so hard for me to read that articles. Now the widespread of notoriety of Nineveh's inhabitants and their wickedness made it challenging for Jonah, Hebrew, son of Amittai, good guy, to comprehend this divine command. Jonah's heart felt no compassion for the city. Even though he completely agreed with God's fairness in punishing the wicked. But he could not understand why. Why God? Why would you want to give Nineveh, the people of Nineveh, a second chance with mercy? As a result, Jonah decided to run away. That's why chapter 1, Jonah is running from God. So this story portrays a significant breakdown in Jonah's life. As follower of Jesus, as a Christian, as the one who is close to God. A conflict arising from an intense pursuit of righteousness that makes Jonah so fanciful and unforgiving, even towards those as harsh as the people of Nineveh, and thus disconnecting him from God's grace. And moreover, in the historical context, no prophet from Israel had undertaken a journey to another land to deliver a message from God. So Jonah's hesitation is understandable. And additionally, questioning the rationale behind giving this seemingly wicked people of Nineveh a chance to repent. Jonah defied God's command. And chapter 1 verse 3 says, Immediately, God says, Arise, go to Nineveh now. But Jonah immediately headed off to Tarshish to escape from the presence of the Lord. Jonah's choice to head for Tarshish instead of Nineveh vividly illustrates the intensity of his resistance. He deliberately moved in the exact opposite direction of God's command. God said, go east. Jonah replied, no, nope, I'm going west. Now, it might be tempting to mock Jonah for his inclination to run away and his apparent harshness towards God's commission. However, with all honesty, Jonah serves a mirror reflecting our own tendencies, at least my own tendencies. While not all of us are tasked with pronouncing judgment in the foreign land like, like Jonah, yet the journey of following Jesus Occasionally, demands undertaking difficult tasks or obeying challenging commands. How many times have we too found ourselves running away from God because we don't like His commands? Maybe commands to forgive your enemies. Like Jonah, God one day asked me to forgive my uncle. I think I said this story before. I used to have a list of persons that I hated 
There were a total of 42 names, mostly family names. Even by just hearing their names or having a thought of them, my heart will raise in anger. How could I not hate them? One of those names was my uncle. He took advantage of my mom's kindness. And then he tricked her in such a way for, her, for his own personal benefits by committing financial fraudulence. For years and years, we live in fear of affliction due to his actions. There were times when I considered harming him. I was once a bad boy. So I still have a few bad friends who were more than willing to help me out. So one day I went to see one of them asking for their evil genius insight on how to harm my uncle. But then to my surprise, he said to me, if you were still the old Daniel I knew, I will help you gladly. But man, you are a new person. You are a man of God. I cannot help you. I went home crying. God used unexpected source to prevent me, a man of God, from doing something wrong. It's like, you know, Balaam, the prophets, wanted to curse Israel. And then God stopped Balaam by making donkey to speak to Balaam. I then pray for forgiveness and thank God for preventing me from doing something evil. Then I slept because I was too tired emotionally and physically. The next day I woke up and when I look on, I look up on the list of the persons I hated. My heart and mind were changed. If you ask me how, I cannot explain. But one thing I know is that the love and forgiveness that God gave me empowered me to change that list. It's not my own strength. From the list of the persons that I hated to the list of persons that I keep in my personal prayers. It almost felt like my heart expanded and warmed up inside. It was an amazing feeling. But this is not the end of the story. A couple months later, the other uncle of mine passed away. So all families gathered to pay respect in the funeral home. And I knew that I would see my uncle, the one whom I hated, in the funeral home. And I was ready to meet him. But to my surprise, he came to me first and gave me a hug and then whispered me, Forgive me then. Forgive what I did to you and to your mom. I am wrong and I will make it right. But I need time to fix it. Without saying a word, I also cried and hugged him even closer. On the way home from the funeral home, I experienced such a freeing feeling deep in my heart. An author, Louis B. Smets, was correct when he said, to forgive is to set a prisoner free and to discover that the prisoner was you. Friends, we all face similar issues. And I'm assume, I assume I'm not alone in this. We all are guilty in small or big ways for not loving, for not praying, or for not extending forgiveness to our enemies. And as followers of Jesus, we all know that the reason we love those who mistreat us is because God has first loved us. First John 4.19 says, We love each other because He loved us first. So the supernatural love of Christ that came first to us is the basis and the source of strength to extend forgiveness to others. We are intended by God to love others. And that includes our enemies. Truly, to love our enemies is counterintuitive. The world says, get angry. But God says, pray for them. The world says, get revenge. But God says, forgive them instead. 
The world says, don't spend your time loving bad people, but God said, love them anyway and anyhow. Loving and forgiving people who have hurt us is undeniably difficult. But friends, the good news is God has a healing power that will guide us to see the beauty of letting go of forgiving. A desire to forgive is not something, by the way, that happens in a day or two. Sometimes it may take months or even years. It requires patience, humility, hope, and strength in Christ to be able to forgive and move on with life. However, it's important that we give at least a try to forgive others who have wronged us so that we ourselves can embrace God's mercy and peace with Him. Jonah's story is like a downward slide away from God's presence when he is reluctant to extend God's mercy to the people of Nineveh. First, he leaves his small village in the northern Israel and then hops on a ship headed to Tarshish. But wait, it gets crazier. He ends up going even deeper in the huge belly of a massive fish later in the story. Who will have thought? Now I guess Jonah's story wants to inform us that running towards the presence of God is always far better than running away from the presence of the Lord. Jonah's intense hatred, unwilling to forgive, towards the people of Nineveh made him choose to go from the presence of the Lord. Running away from God only make things worse, not better. Now, if you look closely at the actions, all the actions, firm actions in this chapter, you can see that Jonah went down four times after he decided to run away from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa. And then second, first four, he went down into the hole of the ship. And third, he went down into the sea. Now, how far God would let Jonah run from his presence? God let Jonah go pretty far. He let Jonah down into the belly of the great fish. Nobody can go that far. And this is a man of God, yet he went that far. Maybe you are wondering how much God will let my kids, my parents, or I mess up. Well, the truth is I'm not sure. But if we take a cue from Jonah's story, it seems God is pretty patient. And he doesn't always put the brakes on right away. His patience allows us to drift afar from him. Far enough until we reach the belly of the fish. Still, when the things get out of hand, his kindness steps in like sending a big fish to reel us back in. If God didn't care, he would let us stay stuck in our mistakes or sins forever. So I guess being temporarily stuck in the belly of the fish is far better outcome than remaining perpetually stuck in our mistakes or sins. Jonah's connections with God took a turn for the better during his unexpected vacation. Three days and three nights retreat alone with God inside the great fish belly. Smelled more fishy than a five-star resort. <laughs> I like sushi, but I don't like inside the sushi. <laughs> Amidst the strong and unpleasant smell, Jonah knelt down in a heartfelt prayer. Check out Jonah's heartfelt prayer in chapter 2. And surprisingly, God not only heard Jonah's prayer, but also, chapter 2, verse 10 says, God spoke to the fish, let him out, and the, and the fish obeyed. Jonah, the outcome, Jonah got sped out onto the dry land, somewhere perhaps near Nineveh, 
or maybe even in Nineveh itself. It's amazing. Picture this, Jonah still probably stinky of fish. Get round two from God. The divine message is the same. Arise, get up, go to Nineveh and share the message I've got for you. Talk about a divine sequel here. Like God gives Jonah a second chance with the same order, go now. And Jonah finally listened to God this time and ended up in Nineveh. Hey, this is seriously a huge city that took him a whole day to wander through the city. Left Bridge is only 15 minutes driving. This is way bigger. Once in the heart of the city, Jonah kept it short and sweet, his message. You can see that in chapter 3 verse 4. His sermon was so short, basically he says, Hey folks, brace yourself. 40 days from now, Nineveh will be destroyed. That's it, no benediction. He, I assume he was still reluctant at that time. That's it, that's his sermon. And surprisingly, the people of Nineveh were not just nudging along. They bought into Jonah's warning. And imagine this. The whole city declared a fast. And everyone from the big shots to the little ones traded their regular outfits for sackcloth. Now, sackcloth is the go-to attire when things get tough. It's like a universal signal for saying sorry, for repentance, and turning things around, whether it's personal crisis or a national one. From big to small, humans and animals, what a sight. From there, from where I came from, by the way, it's funny for me when I first came to Canada to see the way you treat dog. To see a dog with winter clothes roaming around on the sidewalk. I remember Ben Sapphire, Daddy, look at that. What happened? Oh, a dog with a winter clothes. We don't normally dress dogs in Indonesia. Dogs are dogs. Now imagine you see a dog in a sackcloth. Dog in a sackcloth. Animals repent because of Jonah's message. Now the uplifting message within the overall story of the book of Jonah is that not only that God grant a second chance to, to, to Nineveh, but he also extended a second chance to Jonah, God's prophet. See the concluding words of Jonah in chapter 4, verse 9. And see how God lovingly responds to Jonah. They are so unexpectedly positive, really positive. At first, God offered Jonah another opportunity after the fish spat him out of its belly. And this time he obeyed, delivering divine message to Nineveh. The outcome unfolded as Jonah had anticipated. The city repented and its impending judgment was canceled. However, Jonah's response was unexpected. He was angry, making no progress and remaining unsympathetic unsymp to God's compassion. He didn't like when the Nineveh repent. My goodness, wrong sermon they repented but this story of jonah has a remarkably beautiful ending firstly it reveals god's enduring patience with jonah engaging in conversation see chapter 4 allowing him to express his anger and complaints but gently then challenging the falseness of his position don't forget you are prophet messenger of god and i am your lord you forget your position here, Jonah. But still, God graciously and lovingly responds to Jonah. Secondly, it's worthy of our attention. Jonah himself wrote this story, indicating that he eventually aligned with God's heart. The narrative served as a rebuke to finitiveness and revelation of divine grace to his own people. 
as we reflect on this story it transports us to the days of one Christ who declared I am standing before you greater than Jonah someone Jesus perfectly aligned with God's righteousness and infinitely more so yet in complete fellowship with God with God's compassion this one Jesus fulfilled to fulfill righteousness willingly bore the sin of the world so our call is to adopt the mind to uh, the mind of Christ and heeding the warning and finding encouragement in this book Jonah now next time you find yourself seemingly trapped in the depths of life's challenges take inspiration from Jonah's story just as he turned to God in repentance and sought God's mercy within the belly of the fish remember that Christ the Lord of the abyss God is there even in your lowest moments reach out in humility seeking his guidance and mercy for God is there to lift you from the depths and guide you toward renewal Christ is lower still when you are in your lowest position let us pray Heavenly Father we come before you with hearts filled with gratitude acknowledging the transformative power of your love and forgiveness as revealed in the story of Jonah we thank you for the lessons embedded in this narrative showing us the depth of your mercy and the capacity for change within the human heart we thank you for your enduring patience with us just as you displayed with Jonah in moments of stubbornness and disobedience you lovingly, you lovingly guide us back onto the path of your righteousness we are grateful for the second chances you graciously offer allowing us to experience your transformative power Lord we lift up our own hearts just as Jonas was changed from the hatred from hatred to love we thank you for the love and forgiveness that empowers us to let go of bitterness and embrace compassion help us like Jonah to see the value of extending forgiveness even to those who have wronged us in our intercessions today we bring before you those who like Nineveh may be living in darkness and ignorance we pray for your light to shine upon them for hearts to be softened and for lives to be transformed by the message of your grace may your spirit move mightily in the hearts of those who are resistant leading them to repentance and a renewed relationship with you we also intercede for those who like Jonah struggle with forgiveness and harbor resentment oh Lord grant them the strength to release the burdens of anger and hatred replacing them with the peace that comes from your boundless love let your healing touch be upon relationships strained by past hurts fostering reconciliation and understanding and Lord we bring before you the brokenness of our world where vengeance often prevails over forgiveness we pray for nations torn by conflict for leaders of the world to seek reconciliation rather than retaliation may your peace which surpasses all understanding reign in the hearts of individuals and communities and the leaders of the world as we reflect on Jonah's story help us to embody the love and forgiveness that you have shown us may our lives be a testament to your transformative power and may we in turn extend that grace to others in the name of Jesus the Lord of the abyss our Redeemer and Savior we pray Amen friends every good thing is a gift from God the food we eat the things we have the time we spend the friends we have our whole lives we give our lives back to God as a way of saying thank you to God 
sharing money with those who are in need, giving food to those who are hungry, and spending our time, quality time, to help others. Let's prepare our hearts and our offering as we sing Lord of All Power, hymn number 626. <laughs> God of new life, out of the abundance of our lives, we offer these gifts to you. Through your blessing and our willingness to share, may these offerings become a source for hope and love in this church family and in the community beyond us. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. Doxology. Friends, may God's arm enfold and protect you. May God's word inform and inspire you. And may God's love infuse and transform you. And may God's spirit flow and empower you now and always. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. Amen.